Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Eva Marie Yala, Dallas Morning News. I wanted to welcome everyone to our panel discussion on learning from lockdown. In the past couple of months, we partnered with the Christian Science Monitor, the Heckinger Report, and the Education Labs from the Seattle Times, the Fresno Bee, and AL.com to kind of look to see what was happening around the country in terms of education in the pandemic. You know, we had support from the Solutions Journalism Network who, you know, really pushed us to look to see, okay, what is happening across the country that's actually working? That is something that other schools can steal and learn from. You know, a lot of us have learned new skills in the pandemic, whether that's baking bread or learning to sew curtains or whatever. And so, you know, the schools out there are, you know, likely learning these lessons too and getting new skills and being innovative in their approach as they've been forced to shift into this, you know, really unprecedented time in dealing with COVID-19. And I, you know, I like for us to start in Alabama and chat with superintendent at Suzanne Lacey. Now, y'all started a virtual academy about a dozen years ago. So when the pandemic hit, y'all made some really conscious choices on how to proceed. And one of those was being really intentional on how you deployed your teachers and, you know, and what their duties were. Can you talk a little bit about why y'all made that decision and how y'all found that to, to work out for you? Hi, and good afternoon. Um, yes, of course, this has been a very uncertain time for everyone and in particularly educators where we had to really um, maneuver our strategic practices in a hurry to um, recognize the challenges that we had a, that we had ahead of us. And of course, um, for our district, we have been on a hybrid schedule up until March the 15th. And on March the 15th, all of our students came back um, as one. So um, early on back um, in the summer, when we began our planning for our virtual academy, very from the very beginning and the conversations that I was having with our instructional leadership team here at my office, we knew that we wanted to separate the duties of our teachers teaching virtually and our teachers teaching from the traditional brick and mortar classroom. We just felt like um, neither could be accomplished very well if teachers were trying to do both of those things at the same time. So, um, we began to talk with our administrators and to get ideas as to the teachers in their building who would want to teach virtually. And, um, and many of those were veteran teachers. Some of those were some of our newer teachers. So we, we really had a mixed bag of new teachers versus veteran teachers. Um, at the same time, we also looked at facilitators to cover our virtual academy for our secondary students. Um, in high schools, for us here in Talladega County, the teachers are not as flexible. For example, we have many small high schools. So if you're a math teacher, you may be teaching four different math preps or have four math preps. So we knew that a teacher having that type of responsibility trying to teach virtually and brick and mortar would not be well and, and no teacher could you know really do either justice so we looked for facilitators um, and most of them have been retired teachers um, from our school district and surrounding areas that have covered our secondary curriculum for those students in our virtual academy so um, really from the beginning our, our goal was to have a robust academic program and most importantly, we felt like um, separating those duties between brick and mortar teachers and um, virtual teachers was important. And then, of course, we added in facilitators to help cover our secondary students. And I will say it's it been a challenge, but it has been an opportunity that we've learned from and moving forward. Uh, definitely um, have ideas as to how we might continue some of our virtual work in the years to come. Now, what are the duties of a facilitator? Because that's something I hadn't heard before. I mean, you have this idea of teachers teaching, and so, you know, why can't they do it all online? If they're going to be a virtual teacher, why right. can't they just make sure everyone's on task virtually? 
Facilitators are retired teachers that we have contracted with to help with our secondary curriculum. For our secondary students, grades six through 12, um, we have a curriculum that those students have been working through during the course of the pandemic if they were on the virtual academy. For elementary students, um, their curriculum was not quote a canned curriculum it was it mirrored what um, teachers were doing in the classroom each and every day so facilitators are teachers they're just individuals that we have contracted with to help support the learning process for our secondary students and so would that include like one-on-one -on -one, uh, support or would it be like chatting How, what does that look like in, in a typical class all of the above. Um, there was a lot of conversation between the facilitator and the student if they were having difficulty in a particular subject area. Um, then they could have that one on one conversation. It, it was a lot of monitoring and making sure that they were meeting um, the expectations for assignments. Um, turning in work and then a lot of close communication with parents. Um, as we know, if you are a virtual student, that takes a lot of um, responsibility, not only from the student's part, but also an adult in the home who's helping to monitor that work and ensuring that students are, are staying on schedule. And about how many facilitators did y'all need throughout this uh, school year? Um, for, secondary, for secondary students, we had about 30. And what's the size of your school district? Um, 7,100 students. You know, in a lot of ways when you're looking at different stores or talking to folks about how online education is going, you hear a lot a very different end of the spectrum from where it is just, you know, very difficult for folks and folks are struggling on one end and then other students are thriving on on the other. And uh, here in Texas, we have one school district at, out of the Grapevine Colleville School District uh, that has an uh, that's had an online virtual academy for a couple of years, uh, I University Prep. And Ian has been a student there for a while. And Ian is a competitive figure skater. And uh, first, tell us you know, why you decided to do this uh, virtual uh, academy and what has been, I guess, the be biggest benefit for you in this. Alrighty, so I just want to say thank you guys for having me. It's like an honor to be here. It's so much fun. I went to university prep. With skating, you travel a lot. There's a lot of competitions, some in-state, some out-of-state. And with um, a normal like brick and mortar school, um, every time you get out of school, you can get more and more trouble. And I never wanted to get in trouble. I do my work, I try my best. So we went to university prep because we travel so much. Plus there's just structure and flexibility at the same time, if that makes sense, because every day I set my structure so I know what I can get done and what I feel at the end of the day, I do my personal best. At the same time, I can move assignments around, switch days, skip a class or something if I need to um, train more or change up my training. So it's really the flexibility that's really helped and set my training um, better in the last four years. And so I imagine you've had a lot of friends who are doing virtual education for the first time this year, right? What are some of the, I guess, big tips that you had for them when they were uh, transitioning to this new way of life for themselves? Um. Typically, I say to them, it's um, you're not going to have someone breathing down your neck. You're not going to have a teacher that's around the corner or a bell that you have to hear or a new classroom you have to go to. So it's really just self drive and self motivation, the belief and motivation that you're going to get it done. And knowing that um, what I find more gratifying with school, and I think this is what I tell people with my version of school, is if I do well on a test or if I do, if I get a good grade, I know I did that. I wasn't in a classroom, I did that. So when I tell people that, you know, just focus, stay on pace, do what you need to do, um, and it actually would be quite simple. It won't be as hard or scary as some people want to make you believe it is. So what's the most challenging part of doing education for you or online? I think the most challenging part is um, distractions. Whenever I'm doing a class and I see um, like a YouTube video, I'm like, oh, I'll go look at that. Or 
if I want to go make some food, I don't have to wait till lunch. I can go get that food right now, uh, which is nice, but sometimes not so nice. So kind of those distractions, you just kind of make sure that you're honing in on what you want to do, because I would love to go get food if it's, food is pretty fun, or I'd love to go watch YouTube or go on Instagram or Snapchat my friend. So it's really just limiting those uh, distractions, excuse me, and focusing on work. Now, uh, in New York, Nicoma Morris is a guidance counselor, and I'm sure you come across a lot of students like Ian who are pretty, you know, self motivated, you know, very focused self starters. And you, know, you would expect a lot of students to really, you know, dig in and maybe even enjoy online education as Ian does. Uh, but, you know, what are you seeing from other students? And one thing that I, I saw in the story that really caught my attention was you saw a lot of students with ADHD actually doing well, which kind of surprised me a little bit. That's not a, a demographic you would think would uh, thrive in uh, virtual education. So when, um, so I'm, I'm a guidance counselor. This year, I've just started being a guidance counselor. Last year, however, I was working with middle school students, um, primarily uh, as an English teacher and as a special educator. Um, and I don't know, how many of you have worked with middle schoolers? Middle schoolers are uh, specifically seventh and eighth graders are a very wiggly bunch. Very, 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 very wiggly. Um, they're not so they're learning still how to sit in a chair and um, sort of do their work and be quiet. Um, but at the same time, you know, they've, they've just gotten the hormone infusion, right? And so they're, they're, they're really, really into connecting with their peers. I should say that they're relearning how to, how to sit still and, and be in a chair. So some kids at this age are, are, are doing it. They're, they're, they're paying attention. They really have their eyes on high school and on college and on graduate school already at age like 12 or 13. Um, but a lot of them, really just are not there yet, even though they want to be there, right? They want to pay attention, but they can't. And so what happens is you'll have some kids who are really, really bright and really want to pay attention in class, but you know, but their 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 best friend is over there um, throwing paper or um, somebody has their phone out or somebody is doing something really, 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 really interesting, but they also want to pay attention to the teacher. Um, and those kids, they want to engage with all of it all the time. A lot of people think uh, about ADHD that it's that they can't pay attention to anything, but it's actually that they want to pay attention to everything. They actually, I think of ADHD as actually a kind of superpower. So what, what online teaching and learning allows them to do, especially if they're doing it from home, is they, they can they can go around and like, like take a moment and like go get a snack, come back, draw, listen to the lecture at the same time, um, write a, a short story, doodle, tap on their desks if that's what they need to do. And it's not actually going to distract anyone because it doesn't distract them. It's just the rest of the class is prevented from, um, from, from focusing. Um, it's, and that's actually, that's, that's the, the difficulty of teaching, right? Especially if you're a special educator, you're dealing with folks who need silence and folks who need um, lots of inputs. So learning from home and learning online gives everybody all those things. Yeah, it, when we talk about education, you know, much of what we see in schools and what we navigate is equity, right? And how to address, you know, who has access and who doesn't, and, you know, who has, you know, different abilities, how to help them survive and, and thrive in these different conditions. You know, have you noticed any schools that kind of do anything specific to help those students with ADHD? Be more focused or be, you know, do better in the virtual, uh, setting? Well, I think the main thing that helps kids with ADHD is having work that is as tailored to them as possible, um, allowing them if they need to in the school setting to like go and take a walk if they need to go and take a walk or to come back um, and just set it up so that they can be their wiggly selves without preventing other people from 
experiencing the silence that they need to experience. So in class, when we would deal with that, typically we would we'd give other like if we let kids have headphones um, that way they can get their music or get their whatever. And the person tapping on the desk doesn't get. Um, middle schoolers like tapping on desks they, <laughs> and lifting up desks and their chairs. Um, they don't get distracted from that. So I think that's just being flexible and not expecting that your lecture is going to have any appeal to them is, is huge. And, you know, what about the workload for counselors? You know, no school that I'm aware of has enough counselors to meet the need for the students that they have, right? Mm -hmm. So how has the shift to virtual education either helped or hurt counselors as y'all are dealing with these different, uh, you know, struggles that y'all have to do and challenges? Okay, well, on the college counseling side, the college counseling side, it's been very, very difficult, not because of, of anything having to do with um, the kids, but because of the, just the college admissions process itself has gotten more and more fractured and, and confusing over time. Um, I'm a woman of a certain age. I remember applying to colleges and that was really, you know, you had paper. <laughs> you had paper, you wrote stuff on paper and then you mailed it in. Now you have to look at like 10 to 15 different websites um, you have to um, get data from all these different places. You have to get um, financial data from this place, da, 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 all that other kind of thing. And so the impact is that because you're not in person, it's hard to um, help. It's it's hard to encourage kids to do all this stuff on their own because for a lot of the time you're using terms that they've never heard before. Um, you're talking about financial things they've never considered before. And you have to walk them through every single step, but none of these um, materials are necessarily written in um, reader friendly language. So there's that on the like emotional counseling side. It's been really, really difficult and what tends to work in that is just making sure that. Um, and, and especially in pandemic time that that you can reach out to kids as much as possible. Typically, I wouldn't um, text kids, but that's I've been doing a lot of that um, during this time because it's the one way you're sure you're going to get them. They weren't raised on email, so you can email them as much as you want, and it's just going to end up in their email box along with all of the spam and all of the coupons from for Macy's or something. Um, so texting is the only way to get to get through to them. And I've been doing that. Do you with find them. that that allows you to build a more, I guess, yes. a natural relationship with them? And Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm actually closer to my kids than I've ever been. I'm sorry, my mm -hmm. students than I've ever been mm -hmm. um, and the people on my roster because I chat with them so much. And also it's easy to chat with their parents as well because it's not, you don't have to take time out of your day at a certain time to text with somebody. You can just do it and they respond when they respond. So it's actually a very, uh, it's a respectful, uh, a time respectful way of communicating. And, you know, we have to find a way of incorporating that without it being inappropriate communication, um, because that's also something we need to be paying attention mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to remind folks, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat uh, as we're going along with our discussion. And uh, as we're talking about equity, uh, Titilayo Tinubu Ali uh, works with the Southern Education Foundation. And, you know, we hear a lot about the digital divide, about how the pandemic has really put a stress and really highlighted, you know, who has access and who doesn't. But throughout the pandemic, we've also seen kind of some really dramatic steps to close that. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been hearing and seeing out there in terms of addressing some of those inequities? Sure, absolutely. And thank you all for having me here. Um, so we at Southern Education Foundation, we work across the, what's considered the typical Southern region, um, 17 states, um, in addition to Missouri. And when the pandemic first started, we really wanted to understand how districts were approaching their transitions to distance learning. Um, we have a network of superintendents across the Southern states. And so we were in listening sessions and really trying to understand what was needed. And in real time, speaking of texting, our director of leadership development was in a text chain with a couple of superintendents 
when they were in real time trying to figure out how to get meals to kids still when schools were closing. Um, and that was, you know, early March. Um, we were really, when we looked at what districts were doing, we were excited to see that most districts, and this probably is obvious, prioritize getting laptops in the hands of kids. Of course, you would have to do that. Um, what was unfortunate is we were following a lot of the policy movements at the state level and the district level was that many of them were short term and would plan to phase out over about three years or so. So while there was a lot of progress to connect students with both materials and also with broadband, um, there wasn't as much that would be longer term. We were excited to see things that were happening in Hamilton County, for example. So Hamilton County schools are in uh, what's known as the Chattanooga, Chattanooga region, plus a, a few other areas. And they really approached connecting students is not just being about connecting students, but connecting families. And so they had this very innovative program called Ed Connect, H HCS Ed Connect, that they had been, uh, they had seeded sort of the collaboration with the uh, utilities and with the business sector prior to the pandemic. And so that's another thing we saw. A lot of districts that were already thinking about these issues and who had already recognized that these were longstanding issues were better prepared than others. Um, and what they decided to do was to provide not just internet access, but the highest speed access to students in any families that have students who qualify for free or reduced price lunch, so students from lower income families, and not just short term, but for 10 years. So we were really excited to see initiatives like that, that recognize that connectivity is certainly about education, and it's also about being connected to opportunities and innovation and looking at this beyond this moment and how can we both support students and support their families and keeping the long view in mind that um, disconnections, disconnection has many ramifications for health, for wealth. And um, we were hopeful, uh, given a lot of the recent federal movement to provide additional funding along those lines, that we'll see more of those efforts be longer term instead of phasing out in the one to three years that we had studied before. I don't think I've heard, uh, other than the Chattanooga Chase uh, case, anyone thinking that long term and that long track as far as uh, getting access to students. I mean, that sounds like that would be particularly expensive when you're looking at that kind of investment. You know, is money the key reason that we're seeing some hesitation to that kind of scalability or long term approaches? Well, I think, well, there were some innovative things that they did in Chattanooga that made it possible. So they had developed a foundation uh, several years ago that has been able to provide more flexible funding than they were able to receive in other ways. So that's one thing that we often see districts do, um, create other ways to have more people buy into what's needed in the community and then channel resources that way. So that was helpful in that specific case. Also recognizing that not all communities have access to that, right? And so that's why really advocating for resources on the federal level is important. And we were very excited to see the 7.17, I'll never leave out that 0.17 billion, <laughs> directed to E-rate, which is a longstanding way to get more students and more teachers connected, right? So states need those federal dollars to support you know, their budgets. Uh, what we saw and what many I'm sure have seen is that over the past year, education budgets were impacted because of the larger state budgets that were impacted. And we can't forget that we're working within a context that we at the Southern Education Foundation are very historically based, right? We were founded in 1867. We look straight into the eye of how our systems were set up inequitably to start and how things like how schools are funded and where schools are and who has access to what schools perpetuate systemic inequities. And so to, if you realize that and you see that, you can't really unsee it and you have to start addressing those policies that were put in place to perpetuate those inequities. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the current funding systems, unfortunately, uh, because many school systems are still primarily funded based off of local property taxes, and we know differences in property wealth, et cetera, that um, 
you know, it is very helpful when you do have those federal infusions to supplement the work that states are already doing. Um, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the money will be spent <laughs> and it'll be spent now or it'll be spent later. And in all of our work, we are, we really try to help policymakers sort of understand the current investments they are or aren't making in light of what this means for the future of their states. Um, this has been done really well. And when we talk about early childhood, pretty much no one will disagree with the fact that if you really start early to help kids have a strong early start, and we know this from the research, that it has an impact and it's actually more cost efficient to do that in the first place. So we're always having conversations about how choices about dollars now can impact the future. And I think that this pandemic really helped everyone see that this isn't just a future issue. This is a right now equity issue. And uh, we're hoping that that momentum will continue. Now, uh, Robin Lake is with the Center for Reinventing Public Education. And last month in February, y'all published a report that really looked at how districts were innovating on the fly, right? On what uh, what school districts across the country were, were doing. And, you know, I found a, lo a lot of the report really fascinating because it, you know, really kind of talked about some innovative things that districts were doing because of the pandemic, which gets me thinking like, what was stopping us before and what's stopping us from scaling these up in the future. So uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the interesting things that you saw that districts were doing out there? Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. It's terrific to join this, um, this really wonderful panel. Um, yes, we have been surveying and interviewing and doing case studies with school districts um, in partnership with the RAND Corporation and others. And you know, I think the um, the most common thing we're hearing from superintendents and other district leaders, and then down to the principal and teacher level as well, is that the pandemic really forced them to do some things that they had always wanted to do, were on the agenda, but they hadn't quite gotten to, or we had, they hadn't found the resources, or, or prioritized, you know, one to one computers or or whatever. And also revealed some things that they never thought were possible. And so all of that is swirling right now for school districts. Of course, they're in the midst of chaos and is still in crisis management and trying to figure out the very complicated logistics. But it's clear they're also thinking hard about um, the fact that, you know, kids were always at different learning loss levels, if you want to think of it that way. Kids always had mental health challenges, social emotional needs that hadn't been met. And so their concern is, how do we use this moment to really meet kids where they are um, and address some of the things that they always wanted to address but haven't been able to get to? And so you know, some of the things that are emerging from our conversations with them in surveys I think first level, there are some things that school districts are thinking about that are just easy and powerful moves that they would like to keep. And you know, the, I think the first category is technology as a communication aid. So some of our panelists mentioned, mentioned the power of parent to teacher interactions, what we think of as this new two-way mirror that is emerging in education where there's you know, a much tighter connection, much more insight into both the home environment and the teaching environment and how they interact. Parents really have been co-producers of education now and folks wanna kind of keep that engagement going. The teacher to teacher connections, school board to parent, you know, all of those just, you know, oh, why did we ask people to drive 30 minutes for a 10 minute meeting? That didn't make sense. So that's one no brainer. Another no brainer, I think, is that districts would like to keep learning going no matter where or when it needs to happen. So when kids have to go out on sick days, when there's a natural disaster, um, potentially migrant families, kids like Ian who have a, a passion and something that you know they really need to focus on and they need to fit school around that to some degree. All of that feels much more possible to people and, and really easy to, um, to, to take hold of. And then another category, um, again, we've heard a little bit of this from the panelists, is the, the power to individualize and customize on behalf of kids. 
recognizing that some kids have really thrived in the virtual environment, as we've talked about. Districts in very large numbers are saying they'd like to keep virtual learning as an option for kids who prefer that and maybe open up course specific virtual learning. So if the school doesn't offer calculus, um, there's a possibility to take that course online and even set up an office space within the school to allow that to happen in a supervised way to keep kids on, on task during a challenging course. Uh, in a variety of different ways to kind of diagnose where kids are in their learning and be able to customize for them. Some districts are talking about individualized plans for every kid, that kind of thing. Um, and I guess that the final categories that are kind of coming up um, in our conversations are, um, are there new ways to leverage teacher quality? Some school districts have been playing with a model that they call one-to-many, where they take a master teacher and have that teacher do a powerful lecture and then have other teachers act as more of these facilitators that we've been talking about or um, more individualized support to kids. And then, you know, I think the last bucket is recognizing that um, mental health, social, emotional is just such a powerful need right now. But we can do better on that front. And whether it's technology enabled or some of the lessons that are coming out from the pod and learning hub movement, maybe we can create these smaller learning communities and kind of get community um, support uh, uh, engaged in those models to be able to support kids where they are um, uh, on a regular basis rather than just in a crisis. Um, so there's there's all kinds of stuff going on in school districts and exper experimenting, reinventing high school is kind of on their list of to do's. Uh, but I think you know what holds everybody together is the goal that eventually we need to get to a more joyful, humane, individualized and healthy learning environment, um, not just technology enabled. Yeah, you talked a lot about social emotional journey of students, and I think that's one of the things educators have really talked a lot about more than in a normal year is the social emotional struggles students have had uh, during the pandemic. So I want to go back to Ian for a second. You know, when you made the transition to virtual education, did you struggle with that isolation, or you know, how have you done that, and how have you, I guess gotten your social socialization with your classmates since you're in this, you know, kind of remote setting. Yeah, so the good thing about when I went to university prep is um, brick and mortar school wasn't the best for me. I didn't quite fit in well there, um, just personality wise, and it wasn't my learning structure. So that said, it did like when I went to um, online school, you leave a lot of friends behind from brick and mortar. And so to kind of subsidize for that, I'd meet them, I think every weekend for like coffee or um, honestly, the time we'd spent together is probably more than the time we actually spent together in school, especially because in school, if you're trying to talk to each other, it might be, you know, you can't really talk to someone. So when I meet with them on the weekend or something, I actually get a lot more time or one face-to-face -face conversation one-to-one. -one. Um, but with my own school, there's kind of a yin and yang there in the sense that um, our school statewide. So I have a friend down in El Paso that I can't really go see because, especially right now because of COVID, I can't just go off to El Paso. Um, so there's a lot of, I think there's like senior meetings every Wednesday, for kids who are seniors, there's a lot of clubs like photography club. I was in um, a journalism club for a little bit. Um, so you kind of meet a lot of kids there. And then, um, I had a lot of friends at my rink. And so when I actually went to online school, I get to be with them more because I'm at the rink instead of just two hours in the morning, I'm there for four to five hours every day. So um, kind of all that combined, that kind of, um, I felt like I did better socially in the past four years than I ever did in K through eight. And so when you're working on assignments, do you ever have like group assignments that y'all have to do together? And if so, how do y'all accomplish those if y'all are in different places? So typically assignments are individual, but every week, um, instead of um, A or B day or 45 minutes every day, we have an hour class for like, I do um, AP literature and composition. 
So every Wednesday, I meet with all my classmates for one hour with my teacher. Um, and kind of in that hour, it's like a speed round. We go through everything. And then it's kind of where the group environment comes into play because I actually find it better than normal or um, brick and mortar school because in that hour, it's kind of fast paced, you got to go. So you end up relying more on the people around you to um, and the teacher because um, you guys are all together there for one hour once a week. Um, so I find that actually really helps more than seeing people an hour and a half every other day or 45 minutes every day. Um, I don't know how it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, one of the questions we have from the audience is how virtual education across the country, how uh, schools are dealing with state mandate tests or even just test journal to make sure that parents aren't helping students when they take the test. So, uh, I, Ian, I don't know if uh, you can talk about Have you taken the STAR test already? I'm imagining you probably have as your senior, right? And did you have to go in person to take those? Yeah, so um, what's good about my school is last year, I kind of lucked out and have to do that US history one. I was like, ooh, um, but my school, there's kind of like different sections all over Texas. You go to do STAR. So since I live in the DFW area, I go to Grapevine and STAR is in person, so. And Nakomo or Suzanne, uh, have y'all had any kind of issues with parents helping students or overly helping students with schoolwork or with state tests online? Um, how do you monitor for that? Yeah, we learned early on uh, with our elementary students, we do some formative assessments three times a year. and. Um, during the first assessment, we noticed that many of our students were doing much better than we would ordinarily expect. So, of, of kids that were in our virtual academy. So, at that point, we asked parents um, to bring students in for those types of assessments. And, um, you know, we feel like we're getting more of uh, a realistic um, idea of where students are performing. So, that wasn't something that, you know, in the beginning we really had thought about, but we quickly learned that that was something we needed to think very carefully about. Here in New York, they, uh, <laughs> standardized tests were essentially canceled. So, um, I have, so we have no idea. I have no idea, but we do have a sense that some parents are, are helping a little bit more and you see that more with like larger projects because, you know, you're always assessing, you're always doing formative and informative assessment, um, during class. And, you know, if you see that a, a particular student doesn't understand a basic thing, but then writes, you know, in, you know, graduate style language, um, on their, <laughs> On their project, then generally you can tell that they might have had some help at home. Um, but so far, um, we haven't had any standardized tests. They're still figuring it out. Um, I think there will be English testing um, in June, but so far we will we will see. And so, just for context, here in Texas, the STAR test, the state test, is a STAR test, and that is only given in person. And you have to take it physically in campus. So if you're a virtual a student who chose to do virtual learning, you have to go to your school district and take it on campus or at a designated in person location. And for the most part, a lot of the high stakes consequences associated with star test have been put on pause. For example, you know, being promoted from, you know, third grade to fourth grade or fifth grade to sixth grade. You know, where there is still consequences is in high school, students have to pass at least three of five in the course test to be able to graduate graduate. And those tests have to be taken in person. And so there's a lot of conversations, very heated and passionate conversations going on around the state and in the legislature right now about what that will look like and uh, how students in school districts to, should proceed as we're still in the midst of this pandemic and there's still some families who are very hesitant to send their children back to school. Uh, uh, we do have a question for Ian as to where you're located. So I'm in the DFW area. I'm kind of, so geography is a little hard, but um, Dallas is kind of down here. So then you go up a bit, about 40 minutes. There's Grapevine a bit to the left. I know I'm pointing probably to your right right now, but there's the left. And then just kind of down um, straight east is Frisco and McKinney and Allen. So I train in Allen 
and I live in Frisco and then um, I have some family that lives in McKinney so I kind of bounce in between that kind of 40 30 minute drive all right so and this looks like it would uh, be a good question for Robin or TTYO it says how are universities and teacher preparation programs innovating to support pre-service teachers and best preparing them for the many different learning models that districts are trying out or adopting? It's a great question and I honestly don't know. We don't have a lot of insight into that. I suspect that, um, you know, ed schools were, were moving into more um, preparation for technology slowly. I suspect that the um, progress is accelerating pretty dramatically right now around that. And I wonder if we'll begin to see specialized certification for virtual instruction. Um, I'm hearing some glimmers of discussion about that. I think that's on the horizon. Yeah, similarly, that's something that we're wanting to understand as well. What we have seen are ways that districts have been um, innovating to provide professional development to existing teachers to incorporate some of those skills because even where you had the best teachers teaching in this format poses its own kind of challenges and opportunities as well right and so um, that's something that is hopeful sort of looking at how professional professional learning and and have been able to provide it in more of a real time way than they had been before where you bring everybody in and you have the lunch and et cetera, right? Um, some districts have been leaning into what it looks like to you know, prepare the current educator workforce for this type of learning because many are anticipating that um, there'll be some kind of virtual learning in their districts moving forward, even when we're on the other side of this. And so that's that's something that we're looking at as well. I'm, uh, Suzanne, if you're still here, uh, I'd be interested to know if you've heard from any uh, schools or had conversations with any of the feeder programs that are preparing teachers now on what you're dealing with or how you're kind of keeping those lines of communication. So, okay, like I need more teachers with XYZ skills or, you know, what, how that's changed during the pandemic. Yes, um, we have a university very close to our school district and the majority of our teachers graduate from that particular university. They have been very proactive in connecting with local school districts to get our input about, you know, future training and, and things of that nature um, on, a, on a regular basis. They do that and we're very grateful for that. But I think one of the things that you know, most readily has become an issue during this pandemic is just this whole issue of remote learning and virtual learning. Um, you know, by nature, our younger teachers are very skilled with technology, but it's a real art to teach effectively through the use of technology. So I think the defining moment will be those courses or those experiences where teachers are able to emulate those best practices that we often see in classrooms through the use of technology. And um, in our district, for example, we have been working with technology for about 13 years to support student learning. So when we had to transition to remote learning, I felt that our teachers were prepared, um, probably more so than most, because we had been working on those experiences to provide that same level of instruction whether students were in the classroom or whether they were virtually, of course, you know, nothing replaces that in classroom experience. I don't think, but I think we might be closer to the mark um, just because we had done a lot of work in professional development with, with, with our teachers to really craft their skills to be good um, teachers of technology and, and utilize that to support learning. Can I address this as well? Sure. Um, so I'm not I'm, I'm not in a teacher training program. I've already been a teacher for 16 years, but I have had a lot of um, interns and and I've also been alive during the pandemic. So I think that uh, the main thing that teachers need in order to, to function in this world uh, of online learning, but also generally just to function as a teacher, the main thing that teaching schools need to be teaching is curiosity, like, like mm -hmm. deciding that you are going to continually learn and that you are continually going to grow. Um, Google Classroom didn't just come into existence this year. 
Um, the internet did not come into existence this year. Google continues to work the same way it's always worked. YouTube is, has, has been there for some time. Um, same for Pear Deck and for the other one that's like Pear Deck that I can't remember the name of. Um, all of these tools have been around for some time. Kahoot is, is uh, as in an IPO, they did an IPO, but they've been around for more than 10 years. Like these are, these are, and I feel this strongly, these are tools that teachers should have been using all this time. And if they weren't using it, now is their time to do it. I don't think it makes sense to wait around for PD from your, from your school district to make it happen. You need to be involved in teacher communities, which are all over Twitter, all over TikTok, oddly enough, all over, all over YouTube, all on Pinterest, all of them, all the social media. There's probably some on Friendster somewhere, even though it doesn't exist anymore. But that is the main thing that we still need to be encouraging in teacher candidates. I can't tell you how many times I've had interns and they've said to me things like, how do I download a video from YouTube? And I'm just like, oh no, this is not a question you get to ask me. This is a question that you need to Google, right? Like basic, basic stuff. You just need to have the curiosity to look it up. Um, and it's always going to have to be that way. Whatever the next version is of technology that we need to figure out, they're going to need to do that too. And I would say, like going with the equity thing, some of the best work I have seen in um, using technology in a way that builds community and increases learning has been in a lot of the anti racist workshops that I have gone to um, through a variety of different organizations. Look one up, they're all over. Um, they've done a lot of great stuff. And any teacher who goes to some of those, has like I've incorporated some of that stuff and it's been amazing. So you also have to be willing to learn about teaching from people who aren't teaching you about teaching, but who are just teaching and doing great work at that. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a very interesting question. We have someone who's a journalist in Costa Rica who's looking to replicate the ed lab and has been exploring education issues and particularly in, it relates to the pandemic there. And so they would love to hear from the educators and from Ian how coverage of education issues in your schools or in your areas has been helpful to the work that you're doing. And did it get more support or did it help y'all engage in more ideas or learn about more ideas? You know, so I, I would guess just in general, like how has education coverage kind of impacted the work that y'all do? I think in our state, I'll, I'll respond to that. Um, we really appreciate and value the support that we have received from the media. Um, you know, oftentimes I think teachers are, are shortchanged because of um, the respect that that individuals have for teachers in the whole educational process. But I think as we have grown through this pandemic together, there's a greater admiration and respect of what educators do. And, um, you know, parents have seen that firsthand, the entire world has seen that firsthand, the creativity and the innovation that teachers are constantly striving to attain. So, you know, I'm grateful for that opportunity to be able to share and for others, um, just average citizens to see a bird's eye view of what ed educators do every day. So I really think it's elevated uh, the teaching profession and um, I'm very grateful for that because teachers are awesome and they have had the most um, difficult, you know, time through all of this just being in the trenches every day with their kids and finding those ways to still connect and educators just in general but you know teachers are that first um opportunity for for kids every single day and um i'm so happy that you know through this we have many lessons to take away many lessons that have been learned and many opportunities to trudge forward and and really create this awesome school year for next year as we are looking forward to some sense of normalcy Now, uh, one question we have is that there's been a lot of discussion about requiring students to have their cameras on during online education and that there seems to be some kind of relationship between having the camera on and off. And, you know, what is the requirement that y'all are seeing out there either in your district or in the schools that you've been talking to and how do you feel about requiring cameras to be kept on? 
Uh, we did require that with our virtual students. Uh, we just felt that that was important, um, you know, to be able to see each other. You know, there's there's so much with being able to see someone's face, their emotions. Um, it makes the dialogue more interesting. And, um, you know, we, we needed that face to face look with each other every day. And so that is something we did require. Nicoma, is that something that you're seeing in the New York area? Is that a requirement for the schools that you're working with? All right. Uh, how has having less standardized tests helped you rethink tests and what they achieve and what their value is? Do you think we're going to be seeing kind of a rethinking of standardized testing moving forward? I know you can't have any group of educators and students without having some really passionate views on standardized testing. So I uh, kind of like to get y'all's thoughts on how you see that's being impacted now and moving forward. Well, I, I will respond. Um, I, I do think, and that, that's an age old conversation. That's just not a new conversation. Um, I think, you know, there's always the idea that, you know, a standardized test really measuring what needs to be measured. Um, you know, we give a very similar standardized test probably that I took or you took, you know, 30 or so years ago when we were students. So um, I think what I've seen as far as that movement, certainly some of the restrictions have been relieved or relaxed, you know, moving forward for accountability measures. Um, do I think standardized tests will go away? No, but I, I do think there's there's always a conversation about how we can do it best and are we measuring truly what a kid in year 2021 really is able to do and know. Um, you know, in our district, we work a lot on communication, presentation, you know, working in teams, collaboration, all of the things that business and industry are saying that they need to see when students graduate and come to work or come to college. So a standardized test does not necessarily measure those types of things. So if indeed we're looking to change that whole trajectory of standardized tests, you know, how might we measure those types of skills that really are important when kids get out in the real world uh, and are able to function. So, you know, my hope would be that um, they would be a little bit more reflective of, of what students really can do and what they know moving forward uh, when they do graduate from high school. So not having that uh, standardized testing accountability or kind of, you know, pressure on you constantly this past year. You know, did that allow you to free up any kind of either emotional space or any other kind of space to kind of do things you might not have otherwise, or what was the impact of it? Well, I think the impact for us is we just continued as normal as we could, you know, preparing for standardized tests. And we are having our state assessment. We're we're in the process right now of testing kids. Um, we were supposed to start last year at this time with a new test for the state of Alabama, and that was postponed. So we must get that baseline data moving forward. So we're currently in testing right now, and we'll continue that through about um, the third week in April. So, um, you know, it's not forgotten. Um, we know it's important important piece of our learning and, and what our kids need to be able to show competency in. So um, I don't think we really ever changed our level of focus, you know, with the, the skills and the trajectory of learning that we need to do, even if we had been here every single day all year with, with all kids at one time. Um, we just had to do it differently, but we never lost sight of it. But we are thankful for some of the restrictions that have been lifted as we are moving forward. One thing I'll just okay. add is, oh, I'm, one thing no, I'll no, just no, add. No, 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 I was about to ask you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I read your mind. Um, one thing I just wanted to add to what Suzanne, Suzanne said was that um, one of the things that we've been following for some time and are thinking about um, just as schools have had to get more comfortable with technology use in many different ways is how we can really use assessments to inform that feedback loop for instruction, right? So often we're talking about standardized tests in the way that we look back and see what they've learned that year, but how can we really lean into assessment tools that allow teachers to see where students are and then in real time shape instruction to address some of those things. 
um, I did some research on Union City, New Jersey school district and how they built a homegrown in-house tool that they use to roll up data at the like at the classroom level. And every day and every Friday, <laughs> there's some there's some information that they take that impacts what their professional development is, and then how instruction looks like that next year, right? So there's a much you know more humane way, right, to use Robin's word <laughs> that we can we can lean into assessment so that it's leading us to what I think we all want, right? Rich learning environments that are right for each and every child and and also provide educators with that information that they are asking for and really do want to be able to inform their instruction and then to be able to ask for additional support in those areas where they may need uh, more professional learning to shore up the skills to teach in the ways that kids need. And Robin, I had a, a similar question for you, you know, with this kind of everyone kind of taking a pause on accountability or for the most part, taking a pause, you know, have you seen any kind of widespread or, you know, movements or discussions to move away from standardized testing or even accountability within states that y'all been looking at? Yeah, um, I think um, what we're hearing from states is they are realizing that it's, you know, never been more critical to understand where kids are and what they need. And so I'm not hearing folks talking about moving away from um, testing and, and accountability long term. Um, but they're certainly, you know, taking a pause this year and many of them were already thinking about how they could kind of um, retool their approach. So it was more effective. One of the things that is really capturing imagination right now is the idea that maybe standardized tests could be shrunk down to the things that are really most important. Maybe we've tried to do too much and we could narrow it down to the most critical skills and content that we agree kids need to know before they move on to college or career. And, um, you know, um, more interest in an understanding how to assess whether kids have really mastered base that basic material um, in a way that can inform families and teachers and we're talking about just you know informing instruction so that kind of more nimble approach um, there are new technologies that enable um, a lot more than we thought was possible or way of testing but um, that's where I think you know the, the general conversations around testing and accountability are, are heading let's not walk away but let's make it more effective and less time consuming and burdensome all right, well, we are running up on time that kind of flew by really fast, but I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us. We've had a number of people ask about connecting with some of y'all individually. So, uh, if you're interested in connecting with them, you can send an email to edlab at dallasnews.com and we'll work to get y'all to the appropriate emails. So, uh, again, thank you so much for your time and we appreciate it. And I hope y'all have a good school year for whatever it holds for the rest of us in the next couple of months. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And good luck to you, Ian. When's your next competition? Um, end of Austin. Oh, excuse me, end of April, I'll be in Austin. So ah, yeah. All right. Well, good luck. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm.